Welcome to the Biz Bash podcast, where we make biz strategy a piece of cake. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Cammie, but you might know us better as Eliza and Calligraphy and Cammie Monet. We want to help you, our fellow stationers, artists, and calligraphers, confidently build a profitable and personality-driven creative biz. We're here to share our honest-to-goodness advice and actionable strategies for ambitious artists. So put on your party hat, quit being a procrastinator gator, and let's get this party started. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Biz Birthday Bash podcast. We have the one, the only, Brit Roar of Swell Press with us today. I would just like need a round of applause sound effect. (laughs) Hi, Brit. (laughs) Hi. How are you doing this morning? Thank you for having me on. Oh, you're welcome. It's a, I mean, it's a true honor. I we talk all the time, but never um, on a recording. Never when you have a Mariah Carey level microphone in front of your face, and I have <laughs> nothing. <laughs> I that was Britt's first comment this morning. She was like, "Oh my god, like what mic is that?" And do I need to like go get one of those? I was like, no, no, like <laughs> you're totally fine. It does look kind of like insane though, because it takes up like a good amount of the screen space. Britt and I can see each other. You guys obviously can't see us, but it does help with like aiding the conversation. It makes it feel mm-hmm. a little more natural. So you guys, I am going to read a little blurb about Brit, even though I think most of you know who she is. But this is directly from her Learn Letter Press website, by the way. So if you guys haven't taken that class, then you're going to have to at some point. All right. Britt Rohr started Swell Press in 2014. And after six years in business, she has served 600 plus clients, owns 11 pieces of vintage machinery, and is always on the lookout for more and has four team members. Uh, those numbers might have changed a little bit since, but you can tell <laughs> us. Um, <laughs> she's, like, dedicated, yeah. <laughs> yeah. she's dedicated thousands of hours to her love of letterpress, and she was thrilled to finally offer her first online course last year called Learn Letterpress to teach about that beautiful and timeless art form you can find her working from her beautiful studio in redondo beach california and she has a dog named millie that i am obsessed with (laughs) because she needs a little millie needs a shout out for sure so (laughs) anyways there you have it guys a little blurb about brit tell us if those numbers were accurate because do you own more machinery now than (laughs) that state (laughs) The girls at the studio like forbade me after 2020. I think I had bought like one more piece of equipment and then it was like, okay, you can't buy anything else. Like we just don't have room. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know at one point I wanted to live like this, like nomadic, no strings attached life. And then here I am literally like, you know, weighed down by thousands and thousands of pounds of equipment. Um, no, I I haven't counted, but 11 is like probably right. I have six presses, two paper cutters, and then a bunch of other like old vintage stuff, you know, as us letterpress printers tend to do. Um, we yeah. have orders. <laughs> yes. And then yeah, clients, it's in the thousands now for sure, especially after last year. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, last year was a whirlwind, as I'm sure everyone who listens to this podcast knows by now. And I have like seven team members. There's four of us in the studio and then there's two full-time remote people and then two part-time remote people. Okay. Yeah. I need to like go back and like edit that little blurb. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So (laughs) that math is not good. I know. I feel like the numbers for all of this is like doubled because then I was like, oh, she's been in business like more than six years now. So like none of this math is adding up. Clearly, I I just ignore my website and don't pay attention to any of the stuff on there because I know exactly where that little like graphic is on the website and I haven't paid attention to it in years, I guess. That's okay. Well, technically, I need to like that. I had also put on the Learn Letter Press site. So I technically just need to like update that to reflect the most recent <laughs> things, which if you guys haven't caught on by now, I know I've talked about this. I helped Britt <laughs> with her Learn Letter Press course. So she was like my first course management client. And that was back when I was like calling myself Eve. I wasn't even telling people that <laughs> I was the one doing it. <laughs> Sometimes I like I was thinking about this yesterday because I was just thinking about like, oh, I'm going to be on the podcast. And I was like, how I was trying to think back about how that conversation started of you like running the course for me because you took my in person intensive. Mm -hmm. But then how did we get to the next step of like, 
me talking about wanting the course and then me being like, why don't you do it for me? Like, I don't remember how that even happened. Yeah. Well, you're in luck because I remember how it happened. So it's like (laughs) one of my, (laughs) it's like one of my favorite like little stories to tell because it was like, I just thought it was like really serendipitous, um, especially, I don't know, just how everything was going at the time in 2020, because that's when we had that conversation. So I would have taken your intensive in November, 2019. Yeah. And then in 2020, we had like released the stationer summit one more time in April, I think, um, Mm -hmm. before that content was basically like retired at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we had a conversation in July and I just like remember it super well because I was working at Publix (laughs) because I was like, hey, like this is like fun. I want to be able to talk to you about this because you were like, I have some questions. How you, how did you guys do the back end? Because obviously, Britt, you were part of that. So you're like, yeah. how did you do the back end and like the marketing? Like what goes into something like this? Because I'm interested in doing my own online education. And you were like, and I'll pay you for your time. And I was like, that's 100% not necessary. <laughs> but <laughs> I was like, we could just have a conversation as friends because I'm I'm so passionate about this anyways. So like, let's hop on a phone call and talk. And we had to like schedule it between like my shifts at Publix basically. Yeah. Um, Cause that was like literally what I did that summer when everything was kind of falling apart. And so I was like basically kind of explaining to you how we did things and like what programs we had used. And by the end of the phone call, which was probably an hour, like I was basically like pitching myself to you and you were basically like asking for my help (laughs) so we like kind of like came at this point where like oh this could like this could be a thing like it would be like a risk and like neither of us have done anything like this but what would it look like if we partnered and so I think at that point I started kind of writing up like the bare bones version of like an agreement for if we moved forward I was like let me think about this like, let me put on paper and, like, write down what this would yeah. look like, and then we can, like, go from there. And we freaking did. So we had, like, I remember early- all of, like, that part. I, I didn't remember just, like, the specific about, like, that was my question. Like, was it organic? In So I guess it was, like, in that conversation, it became, like, organic flow from me asking questions. But I didn't know if outright I was, like, hey, you did that. Will you do this for me? But it seems like mm-hmm. it was, like, more organic. Yeah, um, I mean, was. 2019 seems like a lifetime ago. It was, like, a different world then. But um, I know. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it I was know. Magical. <laughs> yeah, it was magical. And then it was funny because I do remember. So, like, we did early en- enrollment at the end of that year, at the end of 2020. So, early 2021. So, like, a, a little more than a, than a year ago would mm-hmm. have been when I was there in person, helping kind of like facilitate the filming. And I was laughing about the machinery because you literally had this like foil some like foil presser it was like in the middle of the floor of like the studio and we kind of <laughs> you had know, to like and you know because it was like 400 pounds and that stayed in and we couldn't move it and that stayed yep. in that spot until two weeks ago when I just moved next door to my new studio it yep. literally <laughs> so when we used it we had to sit on the floor in like the middle of the studio mm-hmm. yeah because I remember being like so like what's this and like what's it for and like why is it right here <laughs> I'm like, I feel attacked. I feel like right now you are Sorry. attacking me for my hoarding, <laughs> for my equipment hoarding. No. I love it. No, I love it because to you, you were probably like, I just want to get this in here and like put it down wh- wherever. And then you guys were like, oh, we can't like move <laughs> well, we this ourselves. We didn't put it because it couldn't, it was too heavy. And for everyone who's like, what are they talking about? It's a, it's like a very old very heavy like somewhat tabletop but a lot bigger than tabletop but not quite floor standing flatbed foil press so it can press like leather and books and stuff like that yeah so they moved it we didn't have anywhere to put it we didn't have like a table that I was confident could handle like 300 pounds or something so the movers I was like just put it there and little did I know it literally wouldn't move for like an hour and a half yeah. I mean, an hour and a half for uh, it literally didn't move for like a year and a half a year and a half yeah so that's a good transition into like, obviously one of my biggest questions like for you. And I feel like I've wanted all of the updates personally anyways. <laughs> so now you just get to like publicly <laughs> so now tell me. on the record. <laughs> yeah. So now it's just like on the record of, I know that you had been talking about the space next door for a long mm-hmm. time. <laughs> like mm-hmm. that was like a conversation that I think probably like came up when I was there in person with you. Yeah. So I'd like love to hear about 
how that came to be um, mm-hmm. and like kind of the reasoning behind that decision. And then also just like logistics, like what that looks like. Yeah. Well, like, <laughs> I want to hear jur- this like, like story. <laughs> I'm like, let me start from the beginning. No, I probably okay. like won't start from the beginning. I mean, unless you want like I started in my garage, but like, I don't really know if people care. I feel like I've like talked about like my I don't want to say origin story because I'm not like a Marvel character and it's really not that grand, but it's basically like everyone, like I started my, you know, started as a side hustle in my garage, moved to a studio. And then finally, um, you know, we were in like more industrial spaces. And then finally I found what was like my dream space, which was the space that you went to. And that was in Redondo beach. And it was just like beautiful, which like doesn't really matter if you're like a letterpress printer, but like natural light does matter. And also like I spend so much time, like I probably work like, more than I should. And I spend so much time in the studio. It's really nice to go somewhere that like you love in like a neighborhood you love with like, I don't know. So we moved into that studio in God, I guess maybe early 2019. Yeah. Early 2019. Mm -hmm. And we're in this like, you know, this cool building in this little like neighborhood in Redondo beach, which is maybe like it's part of Los Angeles County for anyone who like isn't familiar with um, California. It's a cute little like coastal beach town. So we moved in that studio in 2019 and we were like the little, the little shop in the back kind of, you know, and I had big dreams moving into the studio. I was like, I want to host workshops. I want to have a little retail area and things like that. And at first, like in 2019, the workshops went great. We had like two in person, in person intensive, maybe three, but like they went really well. That's the one that you went to. It was like six people learning like everything about every type of press and all of that stuff. And I love teaching and I love those in person intensives. And then, like, the more we moved into the studio, we realized that like a little retail section not only wasn't possible with like the footprint of the space and just the layout, but also with our workload and it just wasn't something that like I wanted to deal with at the time because like business was just kind of like really growing at that point. But next door, there was a space that's maybe like 400 square feet larger than ours. And that was occupied. And I remember I was like, Oh, it'd be so cool to move into that space because that space actually had like an entrance that more was a better facilitation for retail and for like, you know, a little brick and mortar and stuff like that. But I would always be like, Oh, I can't afford it or it's never going to happen. And then the tenants moved out and the space was maybe like vacant for like, you know, a year and a half because it was COVID and businesses, you know, obviously I don't need to like recount here what a scary time it was. So the space was vacant. So, you know, I have a great relationship with like the landlord, the owner of the building. And eventually we kind of like negotiated and he said I could move in, which was really exciting. It was something that I really wanted, especially after, you know, there was a time in 2021 when, you know, I was looking at this point, which was like, you know, February, March, 2022. And I was thinking about the fact that like my lease and my current space was up. And after COVID, I was just like, I don't think I want to re-sign a commercial lease. Like, I just don't think like this overhead is huge. Like my rent is thousands of dollars a month. It's probably like, you know, triple most people's mortgages, honestly. And I was just like, I don't want to re-sign a lease. And then I was kind of like, well, my dream has always been to have a studio with a store. Like anyone who has heard me talk just knows that I have this like vision of like a studio print shop in the back and like a little cute store in the front. And my whole reasoning is that I know the world of retail is like this total other beast that I know nothing Mm -hmm. about. And I'm sure if anyone is listening who has experience in like retail and brick and mortar, they're like, Oh, honey, you don't know what you're getting into. But my reasoning is that I'm paying rent for a space anyway, because we need so much space for our studio. That like, yeah. I might as well try to monetize that. And I'm paying rent in an area that is retail zoned. And like, if I'm not using it for retail, then I might as well just go back to an industrial space or try to massively downsize and go into a garage, which is something I've considered for sure. But mm-hmm. so anyway, yeah, like I'm paying this rent anyway. So why don't I just have a little retail area and I'm not going to financially depend on it. I truly just wanted it as something that was like, fun. And I know, again, if anyone's listening, they're like, it's, it's, you know, it's hard work. But like, my whole thing is that like, I don't have to do it. It's not that I'm 
I'm not paying rent to like make a retail shop happen. I'm paying rent regardless. So the retail is kind of just a bonus. And I'm looking at it as like just something fun that I can do. Like I want to, I think of a product and I can make it like we can basically make anything in our studio. So it's like, if I want to make a journal, then let me make 12 and put them out there and see if they sell like that to me just seems fun. And I think Mm -hmm. after the hellscape that was last year, and I just like every ounce of joy, I think in what I do was basically depleted (laughs) that like, now my new mission is to like find things that bring me joy. So I was like, all right, I'm going to do this little retail area. And if it's fun and if it brings me joy, I'm going to keep doing it. But if it becomes like this beast or if it becomes something that isn't fun anymore, then I'm just going to, you know, that area will just turn into a lounge or something. So I'm not putting a lot of pressure on myself. Like, yes, it would be awesome if it was something that was, you know, financially rewarding and, you know, really satisfying and stuff. But also if it's not fun, I'm not going to do it because like after last year, I'm just like, life is too short. Like if something is making me miserable, I'm not going to do it. So, but it's also part of like a larger vision to kind of do less weddings and go more into products. And I hate saying products because to me, it kind of like, I don't know, sometimes it conjures an idea of like, just things that everyone else is doing, like enamel pins or like, you know, journals that you get made overseas or something or things like that. And I don't want to do any products like that. Like I want, I have, you know, we're working on some products and I want them all to be like very intentionally made, very thoughtful, very handmade and things like that. So I'm not going to just like make a bunch of crap when, when I say products. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. No, I, I get that. Like, I think most of your products will be derived like in house truly. From yeah. like conception to like the final thing. And for obviously, like I know what was going on with you last year, <laughs> like personally <laughs> as a friend. But I guess you can explain you don't have to go too in depth because I don't want you to like relive, like, you know, I oh, don't want fine. you to have the PTSD <laughs> of talking about it. It's yeah, fine. It's- I like when I'm in like a good mental. I'm like, I'm totally fine to talk about when things were terrible because it's like it's in hindsight now and I've like I've made it past that point yeah. you know so I'm not like sensitive about it I'm like, okay yeah I so survived <laughs> you did survive so tell us like <laughs> basically how that happened just as like a little bit of a I don't know because you can reflect on it now to like how things got to the point yeah. that they were and how that happened and where maybe like that there was like a an oops moment or, or like, you know, I think I remember you said that all of the team was kind of like, how did we, (laughs) Mm -hmm. how did we like get here? But explain, explain to a little, a little bit to people like why last year was bad. Well, (laughs) you know, I, you know, and I think like my story isn't unique. I think most stationers, if they're listening to this, they completely understand and they were probably in the same position But, you know, 2020, obviously everything shut down and that was a really scary moment. I mean, we actually did fine slash great comparatively um, in 2020, which I know is like weird, but I loved, (laughs) I love 2020. It was like, I mean, you know, and I have to say it's my husband and I out in California, we don't have kids. We don't have like elderly family that were at risk or anything like that. So like really in the context of like COVID, we were very blessed as far as like, yeah, we were kind of like, I'm incredibly antisocial and an introvert anyway. So 2020 yeah. was just like, oh my God, I love this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I got some like government assistance as far as like PPP loans. So I was able to, you know, keep the team on. And then, you know, work on building more like long-term strategy things and things like that. Obviously not enough. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I know that you had like really good, you said you're like, I had really good work-life balance that year. Um, It was the first year of my life that I, that's like, I look back at 2020 and like, I was the happiest I'd ever been because it was the first year of my life that I worked like a 40 hour week because, you know, I went into the studio some days, but also I was, you know, just working from home a lot doing like designs and stuff like that. I mean, we still had a lot of, you know, I took on client work that I normally would never have taken on. I took on like random branding projects and things like that that I normally don't do. But it's like, you know, you have to do anything to 
to pay the bills at that point. I have a ton of overhead. You know, I had commercial rent I was paying. I have a whole team I wanted to keep employed. Um, Mm -hmm. So we were also doing a lot of like change the dates and things like that and kind of like booking projects like further in advance, which is part of why 2021 was miserable. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, and like 2020, I loved it because my whole life, I worked my ass off, you know, before Swell Press, I worked in the production industry and then building Swell Press. It was like, I did both, you know, it was like Swell Press was a side hustle. And then after I quit production and did Swell Press, it still was just like consistent 80 hour weeks of like building this business. So yeah, 2020 was great. And then basically when 2021 came around and everyone is chomping up the bit to get married again, or, you know, to get married, I experienced the same thing that a lot of other people did, which is like, you have your 2020 clients that were delayed or postponed, and they need assistance. And then you have like new clients that you want to book because you also need the income. And it was really hard to plan because a lot of our 2020 couples, we didn't know if you know, some of them just some of them called off the weddings, some of them eloped and did nothing. Some of them moved it to 2021. And some of it moved it to 2022. Like I'm still printing Right now, I'm still printing 2020 designs because of all the delays and stuff like that. So it was really hard to plan how much new work we could take on because we didn't know what our 2020 clients were doing. And the last thing I want to do is, you know, I'm not going to to pester our clients that are already in like a, a highly stressful situation. So we said yes to way too many things. And also, you know, the normal act of like a of, you know, a stationary suite and like booking an invitation and stuff like that, you know, let's just say like, typically it requires 24 emails from start to finish because of COVID and because of all the changing protocols and how many of our clients had to like, you know, our brides and grooms, they were like, Oh, our, our rehearsal dinner place closed or like, Oh, there's a venue cap. There was so much back and forth and things like that and date changes. And like, you know, they didn't know what they were doing that those like the bandwidth that it took to just handle one client basically like doubled or tripled. Mm -hmm. So on top of having like more clients, it was also that. So it was just really hard to navigate, you know, and uh, ultimately like dealing with like the COVID and the post COVID world was like, for me, just thinking about like, okay, how do I want to run a business? Like, what kind of person am I? And what kind of business do I want to run? And in a way, I'm, I'm grateful. This sounds cheesy, and probably like, people want to punch me. But like, in a way, I'm grateful for at least like, if I have to pick one positive thing out of the terrible COVID experience, as far as like a business owner, it was that like, it gave us an opportunity to kind of step into the business that I wanted to run which was, you know, making sure our clients were accommodated and making sure we we handled the situation in a way that was done with like honesty and integrity and not in like a profit driven sense, you know, which I know like my accountants probably didn't like, but <laughs> you know, if someone was like printing their third wedding invitation or stuff like that, it's like, okay, we're going to do this as cheap as possible and we're not going to mark it up or do anything like that. Like it gave us a chance to like step into the level of client service and the level of just like company that I want to be. And I think that was like the one really nice thing is that every single one of our brides and grooms were like, you guys were by far like the easiest part of this COVID wedding planner planning like disaster. And that was something that I was like, really like, it was really nice to be able to like fully step into that. But also, you know, it was just a total shit show that ensued. So it was miserable. And then of course, you have your paper shortages and you have your labor shortages (laughs) and you have your shipping delays. So, you know, add the added time for like client communication to like an invitation suite process. And then on top of that, add the fact that this paper color that you sold them, this is the only color blue that's going to work all like all of a sudden you can't get it anywhere or you need it. And then it's lost on the FedEx truck for up two weeks. So it was just so much of that. And I have an employee who's like my right hand, like we, she helps me basically like run the company and she's amazing. She left for maternity leave from June to October. So Mm -hmm. also during this really, really difficult, challenging time, I was short my like main person. Um, yeah. You know, I had someone amazing replacing her, which was great. But in hindsight, I should have had both of them. Um, like, and I still probably would barely survive. 
So that was 2021. <laughs> it was it was a shitty year. And, you know, there was a point when I was like looking at my lease, you know, the fact that my lease was going to be up and I wasn't sure if I was going to get the place next door because there were other people who wanted the spot. And I was like, you know what, maybe I'm just going to like take this as a sign. I'm so tired of making decisions. Like I'm so exhausted that honestly, like if we can't move next door, maybe that's just a sign that like I can really downsize and rethink Swellgrass and rethink this like company that I built. And if we can move next door, then great. I kind of have to do it because it's what I've always wanted to do. Um, <laughs> so I at least have to like see that part of my dream through. So yeah. Anyway, that's a story. <laughs> You're like, yeah. All I asked, all I asked you was a. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> this is why. <laughs> Like full disclosure, guys, I had told Britt up front, I was like, normally we send like a formal Google Doc with like questions. And I said, but with you, I like, no, I will. I won't need that because <laughs> the conversation flows freely and it's all it's all good information. It's all good context. So, yeah, I was thinking too, kind of like at the end of you explaining that element. So did you guys end up getting to take the time in December that you had kind of wanted to like step back and have a little bit of space. And so what does that, and what does that mean for this year? Like how things are going to look going forward? Yeah, no, I didn't. I know I talked about, <laughs> about that, about like taking December off. I mean, it's been a dream of mine since like starting Swap Press to take like a true sabbatical. However, that's something that's really hard to do when, you know, you're running a company and you have employees and stuff. And I, I do think like still I'm, you know, I'm working towards building a company and building the systems that it's going to happen. But no, I didn't get to take that time off. Um, I mean, I did go, I went back to Atlanta last year, like my sister had a baby. So I was there for maybe like three weeks, mm -hmm. you know, helping her with that. So that was really nice. But I was still kind of like working from there. Yeah. But plans to take like a big chunk of time off are definitely still there <laughs> still in the works yeah, yeah. so what's going to be your focus this year then like doing more products and are you still doing weddings but you've just like scaled back on that a lot obviously like you're doing yeah. some sort of like 2020 printing still yeah so we're I'm always going to do weddings I'll never not do weddings but the scope of what we're offering is more within like our stock or like collection designs I'm no longer doing fully custom designs I just after last year and just churning out so many custom designs, which like I, some of them I'm so proud of. You yeah, know, some, some they're of my really cool. Some of my favorite work, but constantly like being creatively on is like the most depleting thing. And I hate like I hate talking about like the creative process or shit like that because I think it can start to sound like really pretentious or something. <laughs> but like it really is so draining. Like when you're just like, yeah. okay, be creative. Okay, think of something amazing. And it was like that nonstop. And then on top of that draining, just like, it's just an energy suck. You then have to, like, you send your design that you love to clients and then they provide feedback, which in my mind, because I'm very set in my ways, I'm very specific about things like their request to like change one font completely ruins the design in my eyes. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. it was, it just got to the point where I still love what I, at the end of the day, like what I produce with like the custom and like the fully custom weddings, but it just got to a point where like, I want to channel that creative energy into creating things for, for myself, you know, the primary focus of that being more collections that people can just buy as is. So I'm going to make the design that I want and you know, that's going to be available or also art prints and products like, you know, yeah. and I should say like when I say products, art prints is going to be like a big part of that. But I would rather just spend that creative energy and place it there because I think what I've realized is it's like such a finite resource, like the enthusiasm and the time that you have to put into being creative is just, it's so limited. So mm -hmm. we will do custom, but on a much, you know, in our semi custom is kind of like custom to some people where it's like, if you pick, you know, if you pick like, you like that font, and you like that leaf element, then that's like considered semi custom for us. Mm -hmm. But full custom, um, it's just not something that I can do anymore, which is scary, because it was such a huge, you know, it's, it's a big payday, you know, yeah. like these big custom jobs. I mean, it's between like, 15 and 25,000, you know, mm -hmm. so it's scary saying no to that. Um, yeah. So that's like a big leap. Like I just got 
you know, a, a high end wedding planner, like last week was asking me if I had availability for a custom wedding and their budget was I think like 30 to 40,000. And wow. I, I slept on it. And then finally, I just was like, I don't want to, I don't want to do it. Like, I just can't, I can't have that hanging over me knowing that I'm going to have to like be on, you know? And like, yeah, that was a big like mental block for me. Like as I started kind of climbing, climbing the rungs, if you will, of the wedding industry, yeah. because there's always kind of like that feeling of like, needing to like level up, get higher Uh paying clients, work your way to luxury. And I remember thinking to myself one day, literally what you said is I was like, I don't know if I have the creative ability in me to like perform at that level, like consistently all the time, because like with more money requires like something more unique, more this, like more yeah, that. Yeah, like, the pr- like the pressure sometimes when I'm designing in front of a blank Adobe Illustrator page and the pressure to like create something that hasn't been done before is truly original, you know, really speaks to the couple is just like sometimes like the pressure alone isn't worth it. And it's not to say I'll never do custom again. Like I, I like to think that maybe like next year, if, you know, there's a couple, if there's like one or two opportunities that like really, really excite me creatively, then maybe I'll have like the time and the energy to do them since I've like stepped away from it for a little bit. Right. You could be like, we accept two $50,000 weddings a year. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Like for stationary. And and that's like, you know, I might do it and I might not. Um, And my plan is to get the business to a place where I, where the choices I'm making aren't, you know, based on financial, you know, I don't want to say like, you know, obviously running a business, you have to make decisions based on, financial reasoning. But I want the decisions I make to be truly just based out of like, do I want to do this? And is this going to bring me joy? And if not, then okay. But yeah, I mean, the stress of those, you know, and I don't want to say that I don't have any more, I still have a handful of custom projects, you know, taking me through this year. But as far as like any new inquiries, it's just, you know, I'm just not into it. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> That's good. And it's good that you I'm proud of you for saying no to that because it's like really hard. And I think <laughs> I think a lot of people I I've I've heard that a lot. And like Cammy has even talked about that too. Like yeah. as she's transi- transitioned away from weddings where it's like ten to fifteen thousand dollars, even yeah. bigger sometimes, depending on what people are I paying. I mean, for. like the biggest thing that I'm like the irony is not lost on me that now I am finally at the place as far as like the portfolio that I have and the clients I've worked with, I'm finally at the place where I'm getting the inquiries for the jobs I had only dreamed of getting, but I'm too burnt out to do them. And I burnt myself out doing them like at a level that is like a lower price point, basically. Like some of the custom work I was doing, I think I was like massively undercharging for, but they still got, you know, like the real estate in my brain of, you know, so it's just like, believe me, it's, I, I think it's funny that I'm like, oh, I'm finally now getting these offers for these projects I dreamed of. And I don't want to do them because I'm too burnt out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. And th- there's something to be said too for like, uh, gosh, I don't want to like, put this on our clients. But sometimes it's like, we can't thrive to our true creative potential when you like you said, you feel like you get feedback sometimes that you're oh like, well, God. this like yeah. ruins the design. It almost feels like someone yes. would have to pay you to be like, Brit, I'm paying you to do what you want. And there is and there is yeah. no feedback. And I, and I have done like I have a handful of custom designs that I just did. And literally the client feedback was like, oh, the time of the welcome party changed. But like that was it. And it was the most amazing feeling. And I'm like, oh my God, if it was like this every time, I would do custom forever. And it was just like, it was one of those feelings where you send the design and I felt like I was like, you just send it. And I'm like, I nailed that. Like I totally mm-hmm. nailed that design and they loved it. And it was true. It was so rare that I remember <laughs> that I so clearly yeah. remember it because it happens so infrequently. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah that alone causes like enough of a, that feeling of like exhaustion of like, I've already put so much into this and now you want me to change it much into this. And now I have to like rework the whole thing. Um, yeah. So it's like, I'm it's yeah. The client process can be 
difficult to navigate for sure. Yeah. (laughs) I'm so excited to continue to see kind of like what you put out there personally in terms of like what you guys are producing in the studio. I mean, I have definitely the Christmas that you released a bunch of products that was also 2020 when you were also kind of keeping yourself, but like, I definitely have like, I had like note cards, like both of the spiral notebook pads, like your candle. Mm -hmm. And then like this past Christmas, um, or you did like a really limited release print. Like a print release. Yeah. yeah, And and I have like one of those. Like, (laughs) it's so funny, like looking forward to this year, I was like telling, I have a a incredible um, business coach and her name is Wynn Clark. And I've been with her for like three or four years now. Half of our sessions are just me crying in the <laughs> crying in the car. <laughs> but now they're not. But um, God, she's amazing. But anyway, you know, we always like set out the year and our goals and stuff. And I was like, honestly, I had so many goals for 2021, and they all, I didn't meet any of them. I had things I wanted to do. I had a huge, I you know, I had this like idea of this like beautiful polished print release I wanted to do, and all this stuff that like I didn't meet any of them. But I'm so scared. I'm scared to like set goals for 2022 because of like the disappointment and like, I know everyone's like, Oh, be easy on yourself. You survived. And I I get it. I am like notoriously hard on myself and all of that stuff. But yeah, like I, a really like nice, well thought out, well planned print release was, was a goal of mine and it didn't happen. And finally I was just like, it. I'm just going to like print these, like a couple prints. It's not going to be this like beautiful email sequence. It's not going to be a beautiful page on the website and all this stuff that I wanted to do. I was like, I'm just going to do it. And that was really hard for me to like push something out before it was, you know, before it was like what I deemed as like perfect or even like acceptable. But you know, my husband pushes me forward a lot. He's like, just do it. Like no one's going to think that this is like as bad as you do. (laughs) Just like no one cares that there wasn't like a beautiful website landing page or anything like that. So (laughs) I did like a mini, you know, like a mini print release, but I have, yeah, I have plans for a lot more stuff in that department. But the trick is like getting, you know, you have to do what you have to do before you can do what you want to do. So it's like, I've got to get through our like booked clients and stuff like that. And then I can, you know, give my little like passion projects the time that they deserve. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about kind of where you find your inspiration and then something that I know you're passionate about, (laughs) which is like not ripping off other people's work. (laughs) Woo! This is going to bring out the preaching in you. I am sure of it. (laughs) But first of all, like where are you finding your inspiration for design and, and how are you kind of like bringing that into your work. And then, and then we can kind of transition into talking a little bit about some like copycat things and mainly why it like hurts people to do that, yeah. you know, like, yeah. so yeah. yeah, that's um, loaded. That's loaded, but I'm going to yeah. let you, I'm going to let you run <laughs> with right. it. Cause I know there's plenty to say. <laughs> um, design inspiration. I try to find it anywhere and everywhere, except for other, <laughs> except for other uh, stationers work. Yep really like for my custom designs, the inspiration was always driven by the location, whether it's like the city or, you know, the place it's in or the nature around it or details about the venue. And then like the couple's love story. Like I just did a, a wedding for this like lovely couple in Florida and it was like a fully custom wedding and they both um, went to Notre Dame. So they were like clovers are like important to us, but like, we don't want to look like St. Patty's day and all this stuff. So I was like, okay. So I, you know, I drew like something that kind of looked like a clover, but it was really like a Spanish tile looking thing. And like, that was kind of like pervasive throughout the suite. And like, so things like that kind of inspire me. Um, also I live in like a, what I think is just like a very beautiful part of the country with like the mountains and the ocean and things like that. So that's obviously why like I'm very drawn to like tropical foliage and things like that. I just, I love anything that's like beachy and bright. You know, I love like vintage matchbooks. I love vintage Palm Springs signs and stuff like that. Like, it's funny. I like, I thought about, I'm working on a, like my new website and I thought about like putting something that's like, if you're getting married in a ballroom, like I'm not the person for you. <laughs> Cause like, I think like, <laughs> no. no, I know what type of clients I attract, you know, and what, and it's usually like, I very rarely do Southern weddings. I literally think I've done, I've done two weddings in South Carolina. Like, I think that's it. I've done maybe one, two weddings in South Carolina and two weddings in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Um, Like I don't do Southern weddings. I don't do 
ball gown, you know, or like ballroom weddings and stuff like that. It's more like, you know, destination focused and things like that. So it's, it's nice to be able to get inspiration from stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I think there's a lot of just like things that become trendy in design. You know, I think like right now there's a certain style of like branding that is like very, like, I love it, but it's like very trendy. And I'm like, okay. And like a year, is this going to be so dated? Um, right. You know, like, I think like two years ago, it was like the seventies thick serif fonts. And now I'm like, I don't want to see a seventies font for as long as I live. Um, so right. I think it's also like I get bored like, you know, like, like ship lab trends. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah. cause when that was like really big, I kind of kept asking myself, like, how long is this really going to last? And like yeah. in 20 years, like, is somebody going to like look at a house that was made with all shiplap on the interior and be like, what, yeah. what were they thinking? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then like, because we do like not only such a high volume, but I just, you know, we, I think like if there's some trends, I'm may be able to like identify them and act on them faster. I also just get really burnt out. Like everyone now is doing like arches or half arches or like a two, I, we call it like the tombstone shape. Like my group of yep. friends, like I will not do a wedding invitation in tombstone shape. Like if someone wants that, I'm like, I'm not a good fit for you. There's just certain things that I hate and I don't want to do. And they just kind of seem basic to me. So yeah, that's kind of like design wise. I do think there's like certain trends, but there's also just like, I think we're all also either subconsciously or consciously fed inspiration that kind of like leads a lot of us to like produce somewhat of, you know, a similar aesthetic. Like there's another stationer like Emily Baird and like I, you know, we're friends and I like see Mm -hmm. some of the stuff she's printing and I'm like, Emily, I literally am printing that exact same concept today in the studio. Like we like go back and forth because it's so funny because our design styles are in some ways like very different. Mm -hmm. Um, But also as far as like, I think like the way that we approach like the certain like mediums and stuff like that. I think there's obviously some type of like, we share some like subconscious, you know, inspiration or something like that, because there's times where I'm just like, Oh my God, I'm doing that same thing. And I think, Mm -hmm. you know, and that happens. I have like a group of a very tight knit group of like stationer friends and we kind of all share ideas sometimes. And it's like the same thing. So I think like something on like originality is, you know, and I'll talk more about like copying and stuff like that, but like, I do think there are certain things that just become trendy or maybe are like starting to become trendy and they're on the forefront of a trend, you know, like, like a wavy edge, like some of our stuff, you know, from last year has like a wavy edge. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I saw like Nat from like Capel and Co do like notepad with a wavy edge. And I'm like, Oh, I'm doing that same edge, but you know, (laughs) but it's fine because also these are people that like, you know, most of us, you know, I hate saying like community over competition because that just seems cheesy, but it truly is like a lot of us, especially after the hell of 2021, a lot of us are friends and friendly. And I think whenever there is a topic of like, is this inspiration or is this copying? I think like anytime, I think you, if you do it with honesty and integrity, like you usually end up like friendly with someone. Yeah. Um, if there is like, if something like that happens. So I had a um, whole yeah. podcast episode dedicated to coincidental creativity. That's what I yeah. call it. It's like basically exactly what like you and Emily experience of like, you yeah, see because like, we're obviously I, like, yeah, I'm sure the algorithm feeds us like the same ads. And you know, it's even stuff just like fashion, you know, like there's certain fashion brands that I follow that have like, that have a like a certain aesthetic that I'm sure somehow influences me or things like that. And I guess my whole thing is like someone who has been copied and someone who has also been accused of copying. I think like my big thing is like of the 7 billion people in the world, I am not vain enough to think I am the only person who has ever thought of this idea. Like I do yeah. think it can truly happen that people you know, I've seen stuff. I've been scrolling on Instagram and I'm like, oh my God, that's a carbon copy. And then I look at the date and I'm like, wait, that was posted like three months before my thing was posted. They probably think I copied them. Like, so yeah. I just think that happens. And I think it's all about um, like how you approach it. And ultimately with, you know, with copying or being inspired, I think it's just like, you know, in your heart, like when someone has like a interaction with you, I think, you know, in your heart, if it's, that sounds cheesy. Um, but it's like, true though. you know, you know, if it's true or not, you know, like I was accused by someone who was a colleague of being inspired by, by this person 
for my landscape prints, which are all based on save the dates that I did years ago. But my landscape print release, you know, I was someone basically said I they inspired me and they wanted me to credit them as inspiration. (laughs) And I was like, Oh, the ego. But I, you know, I was like, but, but you didn't, I wasn't inspired by you. And if I was, I would fully, you know, explain that or even like ask you for permission or ask you if you wanted to do this as a co-release. But like, clearly you can see through my work and these landscapes design I started doing in 2016 or something that like, this is a progression of my work and my aesthetic. I did not copy you. And I kind of was like, is this a hill I'm going to die on? But I'm also really stubborn. And you know, if, yeah. If I didn't copy someone. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bummer. Like, see, like, just like the, I think just the overwhelm of like information that's out there, like we're all just bombarded like every day, <laughs> with, mm-hmm. like visuals and it can be, you know, did you see something and then forget you saw it and then like created it? Like, so yeah. I try to like limit my, you know, exposure to like the work that other people are creating. But I think like with copying, if someone who's either been copied or they think they have or something like that. It's always like, okay, is this possible that this wasn't a copy and it was coincidence? And if it is something that you feel like you need to address with the person, do it in a way that's like respectful and, you know, gives them a chance, like gives them a chance to, you know, to talk it out with you. I mean, I've had a couple of those instances and we've all come out of it being like quite friendly Yes, Um, because sometimes it's like a client is pushing you to copy and you've already booked, you know, that that happened to me recently is like a literal carbon copy, a carbon copy of a very unique save the date we did. And I approached the person and she was like, honestly, the person booked me. I showed them so many other custom designs and she was insistent on this one design. And I was like, look, I get it. You shouldn't have posted a picture of it. You should have told me, blah, blah, blah. But also like, I know what it's like to have a client that's paid you a deposit and then you're on the hook for this money and then you don't know what to do and you need to make this person happy. Um, You know, we have in our contract that we're not going to copy people. We have in our contract that if you ask us to go in a design direction that we're not comfortable with, we reserve the right to cancel your job, you know, without refund and things like that. So I've, and that's, you know, I've learned all of that from like these hard situations. That's where our contract is probably like three pages long. Cause every time I have a <laughs> hard situation, yeah. I'm like, all right, another clause in our contract. Oh yeah. Oh, the base, like our base custom stationary contract is already three pages long without having yeah. like added stuff in it anyways. So yeah. Yeah. Always adding for new things. It, it's not so much too. It's like, I can understand like the being pressured by somebody so hard to create something, yeah. but then it's like the posting it. That's where I'm like, yeah. that's where you like lose me. <laughs> and <laughs> and posting it as under your custom design gallery. I mean, come on yeah. now. <laughs> and, and it's one of those things. It, it, it's like you said, it's, it's easy to see and spot that when it's not genuine. Cause for you, you were like, I have the work yeah. to back this up years and years of like color palettes and how yeah. I post design. Well, and like, my, the thing that I've noticed as is that I think that we identify aspects of our work so easily in other people's work because it's so close to us. Like to use my example of, you know, like the landscape incident, we'll call it like, I understand that because I see my work in everything and that I'm not saying that like, oh, everyone copies me, but I'm saying you can adapt, like you worked so hard to pick that font that if that font exists somewhere else you see it. You work so hard to pick that color palette that if that color palette is somewhere else, you see it. So you see little bits of your work in everything. And it's important to like check yourself and be like, okay, but just because I'm identifying that as a common thread, does that mean it was copied? Or does that mean that this is just something that I'm seeing and I'm easily identifying it because you're so close to the project? Like I'll mm-hmm. see, I'll see little bits of my landscape work in so many other people's, you know, in so many other people's work. And I'm like, but that's just because I'm so close to it. And it's so dear to me. Yeah. Um, so I think that's something to like, also kind of like check yourself and check your ego. Yeah. I, it's also like, this is like such a stupid example, but there's, there's a psych, it's a psychological principle. I can't remember the name of it, which will drive me crazy, but it's like when I, bought my Toyota Highlander. I had like never seen that car before. And then I saw it everywhere. So now I noticed (laughs) anyone else who has a Toyota Highlander, you know, and I'm like, Oh, 
they have one too, or they have one too. And, yeah. and you know, it's like, there's a bunch of other cars on the road, but it's like, your eye is always like picking out the one that you're already like yes, familiar for with. for sure. Yes. Like, and that's why I think like that can happen a lot as creatives and as people who, you know, are trying to create original artwork. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Before we wrap up the episode, because like, obviously our time has gone very quickly and I knew that we were going <laughs> to have plenty to talk about. Like that was not a fear of mine at all. Let's bring it back a little bit to like learn letterpress. We already have people asking like okay. when you you're might- like, do you want to pl- do you want to plug a course to try to make some money? And like, yeah, that'd be nice. When you might open it again, because obviously I'm the one that kind of like keeps tabs on those like emails and stuff. And like, oh, you're trying def- to, you're trying to double time a podcast episode with a with a strategy call with me. <laughs> yeah, I'm just um, kidding. Um, no, I yeah, know that you'll want to open it yeah. sometime this year. I just don't know if you yeah. thought about yeah. when. <laughs> maybe like spring, maybe spring okay. and then winter, I think would be nice. You know, okay. there's no downsides to opening it. Literally, I have people sliding in my DMs all the time. They're asking me like, when are you going to open it? I think the only downside to me is that I just have a natural aversion to posting anything or to anything that's salesy. So it's like, that's the only thing which you're like, yeah, I know you could do, you could do to post a little bit more, um, <laughs> which I know I need to like, I need to get over that big time. I get it. I get that. Like the move in creative thinking is that like, we're not being salesy. We're giving, you know, it is an opportunity to serve. It's an, op- it's an opportunity mm-hmm. to like provide a service to people. I know that, but like being salesy and like doing, you know, promoting self-promotion is very, very hard for me. You know, that's yeah. why I like, bless Instagram. All I have to do is like take a picture of work that I'm like proud of and post it. And like, that's the maximum level of self-promotion I really like ever have to do versus like a little bit more, um, like aggressive sales tactics as far (laughs) as like the course. Um, but obviously that's why I have you to do the, the emails and stuff. Yes. Um, Then you don't even have to think about it. would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. I do think so. That's kind of what I've been, I've been like telling people like closer to summer ish, you know, when they yeah. ask. So yeah, yeah you guys, maybe if you like, are- I mean, we can talk, we can talk about it. Cause I'm open to doing whatever I do have a course coming up in, you know, last year with Kestrel with Ink Me This, I <laughs> taught a class on digitizing calligraphy and that's coming up again in May. And that was really incredible. That talk about something where I, you know, it was like eight hours of content. And I, I talked to you first, Elizabeth, because you're like my go-to now for anything. And I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to do eight hours. And Kestrel was like, just trust me, you're going to figure it out. And then literally it was like eight hours on the nose, all about how to digitize calligraphy, which is truly insane when you think about it. Um, But it was also just like the basics of learning Photoshop and learning Illustrator and things like that. So I have that course in May. So maybe either like before or after that, just because I don't want to be promoting like two things at once. Two things. Yeah. Are you doing it? Are you doing it again live, Britt? Or are you, she's just re-releasing it? I'm doing it again live. Fun. (laughs) Yeah. And if you don't see my face, everyone, it's because being <laughs> being live for like two hours is challenging for me. And it was two hours yeah. and um, two days. So, yes. yeah. But yeah, I mean, there it was, was like, like that, sessions. that course, I got so much good feedback from, you know, I got so many people who emailed me and they're like, I just, I, I printed my first, you know, like calligraphed menu because of you. And that was so helpful. And also like with the learn letter press class, like so many people, DM me and they're like, Oh my God, I just printed this for the first time or, you know, or share like what progress they've made after watching the course, which is like truly incredible to see because, yeah. you know, the more people that like understand letterpress and the more people that love it, I think it's just like the better that is for everybody in the industry. Yeah. It keeps the art alive. It keeps the demand for the art alive. For sure. Yeah, because I was going to say Learn Letterpress is so cool because I really don't think that there's a single other resource out there right now that is yeah. this comprehensive online for letterpress printing because most stuff you find is going to be some sort of like in-person intensive. And I remember doing like a lot of research leading up to us like releasing the course for the first time. And yeah. I was like, I think we can genuinely say that this is like a new frontier <laughs> that you won't find anything else like this which is yeah I mean I wanted to do it for years like especially like the beginning of COVID there was just such a demand for 
online at home courses and stuff, but I just got so tripped up with the technicalities of it because especially because I have like a background in film production that I knew enough about what had to happen. Like I knew enough to be annoying and for it to, it it was harder for me to go in it versus just like a blank slate, not knowing anything. I was like, okay, we're going to need two cameras and you're going to need like, you know, maybe a slider and like, you're going to need a far and then you're going to need close ups of me like turning and adjusting and stuff like that. So I just, I was just like, I don't know how that's going to be possible. And then we found the most amazing film crew by we, I mean, you found the most amazing film (laughs) crew. And it just like, it was that course will go down as like one of the most favorite rewarding things I've ever done. Like it was just so fun to film. I love the live Q and A's. It was so nice to see just so many people not only enroll, but like really engage with the content and really like make strides in their printing or their designing for letterpress. It truly was just like, it will go down in my life. (laughs) as like one of the, the greatest things ever. Yeah. And it was, it truly is like a, course like a beefy course it's not just yes. like a lesson or something or like an online class which I think sometimes I call it I'm like no this like strap in because you're going to be on your computer for eight hours and yes. you're going to leave like no you know and I had like seasoned printers that were like oh my god I didn't know I didn't even know that like I've learned something mm-hmm. so I think that's also the amazing thing is like every time I talk to another station or another printer, like we all do things differently. You know, like I signed up for Nat for Papel and Co. Like I signed up for her class. Um, Cause I'm excited to hear her perspective on how she runs a business and how she does things. Because I think like as many different perspectives as you can hear and take into account is, is really valuable. Yeah, I know. Always to always, always be learning. And ABL, always be learning. Yep. Learn letterpress is something that you can continue to release for years to come, which is part of the reason that we did it the way we did up front, so that you're never gonna have to you're never gonna look at that and be like, I should really re-record that. That's just like not a yeah. thought you're gonna have because we like went insane the first time and there were so many people that came back and they were like, Whoa, like wait a minute. I didn't ex- I didn't think that this was gonna be like master class like level like yeah. production <laughs> and it like really is I know it it's was good. so cool yeah it's still to this day one of my like biggest life accomplishments too yeah oh <laughs> so, god <laughs> um okay I think we'll wrap up kind of on that high note that's learnletterpress.co by the way everybody if you want to learn more yeah. about that course but Britt, if people don't know already, tell them where they can find you on social and online. You can find me on Instagram at Swell Press. And then my website is swellpresspaper.com. And in a couple months, let's like be realistic. I'll say like by the fall, I'll have <laughs> a whole new website with the products and stuff. And hopefully like a, a new fun little direction for... Um, the company. So I'm excited about that. I'm cautiously optimistic about that. Yes. But yeah, for now, just on Instagram at Swell Press. Perfect. Yeah, I can't wait to see that too. I didn't know that was like in the works for you. So that's very exciting. Yeah, like once we get the studio all um, cleaned up and everything, because it's a total mess right now. But once that's all done and decorated and everything, I have like a photographer scheduled to come in and like shoot some stuff. So I'm super excited. I was like having such FOMO because I was like, if I was there, I would freaking be like working for Brit if I lived in California. (laughs) (laughs) I would just be the person to like keep everything organized for you, honestly. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) that's what... um, Berlin and Robin, they're like two sisters actually who work for me. They're obsessed with like organizing. And like every time I open a drawer, there's like a new organizational bin. And I'm like, Berlin's like a borderline professional organizer. (laughs) Right. I'm glad. I love that. (laughs) Yeah. But hey, you are welcome to come (laughs) to come on out. And I know if I ever end up on that coast, um, for sure. Well, I hope like once this, once the retail portion is open and stuff like that, I'm going to have a little, a little opening party. Okay. So you'll come for that. (laughs) Yeah, I will. I definitely will. That's no question. So yeah, thank you so much for dedicating an hour of your time with us to just like share a bit about your story. I'm still not sure like what I'm going to call this episode because it's just Mm -hmm. like a nice like life conversation, honestly. And we talked about a little (laughs) bit of everything. So thank you. And I, of course, will let you know when everything 
releases and all that. But the little bit of housekeeping that I always say at the end is that if you guys are listening to the episode, please make sure to take a screenshot. And if you post it on stories, tag Swell Press on Instagram, tag Brit, um, tag us so that we know that you guys are listening and leave us a rating and review because those always like make our day and it helps other people find the podcast too. So that is all. for sure. (laughs) Thank you. And thank you for everyone who listened during this time. Yeah. All right, everyone. Have a good day. (laughs) Bye. Bye. Hey, guys. We just wanted to hop in and talk about one of our amazing resources, the A to Z directory. All of us have thought at some point, how did she do that or how did she make that? And maybe you don't know where to start or how the heck to produce this amazing product you've dreamt up. Well, the A to Z directory is the missing puzzle piece in your biz, you guys, seriously. So it's built in the form of a yearly membership, and it's your one-stop shop for finding suppliers and vendors for all the things. Literally where to print everything from custom invitations, greeting cards, mugs, koozies, acrylic printing, letterpress, custom ribbon. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, and it literally goes from A to Z. From acrylic printers to zipper pouches, we have it in the A to Z directory. We want to help all of you search less and create more with this list of 300 plus vendors and suppliers. Don't worry, they're very organized. It's not going to be overwhelming and confusing when you join. And this membership also includes access to a private Facebook community. It's incredibly active and involved. And if you need a question answered fast, that is definitely the place to go. Yeah, our Facebook group really is the best, you guys. Everyone is so helpful in there. And we're in there too, um, answering questions you guys might have. So it's a great way to get access to us and ask us things without sliding into our DMs. So we're more likely to answer you in the Facebook group. Just saying. Anyway, (laughs) also in the Facebook group, this is new for 2020 and we're really excited about it. We are hosting monthly power hour Q&A sessions that are live and these are only available to our A to Z directory members. So you can hop in with us live and ask us all your burning questions in real time and just hang out with us every month. And we do these at different times so you can actually be there live and the replays are always available in the Facebook group for members. This resource is priced at $147 a year, which honestly is extremely affordable and it's full of so many benefits, such as exclusive vendor coupons for members only. And we would love to have you guys join. Seriously, it's kind of like our family and our tribe. So visit bizbirthdaybash.com forward slash directory to sign up today and use coupon code podcast2020 to receive $20 off your first year. That's podcast, all caps, 2020 for $20 off your first year. We can't wait to see you in the Facebook group.